horizon was just covered with these flashing clouds and lightning bolts. I actually tried to take my trekking poles down to like lower my tent. I did not want to be there. If I bailed, what would I think of myself? What would other people think of me? Jason wants to go backwards on the trail to I camp. Sleep with that in my back right there? You don't have to sleep on that rock. There's lots of not rock spots. This is why we do it, Joe. Give a little taste of this. So in 2021, we attempted to do the Uenta Highline Trail. We got about 65 miles in and got caught up in a really terrible storm. As we got to Anderson Pass, which is the highest pass on the Uenta Highline, we started to hear rock slides. We started to see lightning. We were getting snowed on. It was looking like a pretty treacherous situation and had to call our ride and tell them to pick us up short of our goal. We were able to escape the snow, uh, but it left us with um, some unfinished business. So the Uinta Mountains in Utah are some of the tallest mountains that we've got, and the Uinta Highline Trail is the highest route that you can take to those mountains. It's about 110 miles long, but the biggest thing to note about it is you go high and you stay high. So about 80 miles of it, you're above 10,000 feet. We had to bail the previous year, so it was a no-brainer that we wanted to do the trail again. Like we had, we had some internal discussion about like, hey, should we just go back and tee into the trail where we had to leave the trail last year and then just finish off the miles? Or should we just try to do the whole thing again? Um, and it was like a pretty anonymous, or anonymous? Unanimous. <laughs> <laughs> it was a pretty unanimous decision. Like everybody felt like, hey, let's just let's just do the whole trail again a week earlier in August than the previous year. And then just to do something different, let's start on the west end of the trail and go east this time. We gave ourselves like a Monday through Friday window. Basically, we wanted to be able to do the whole trip in a work week. A lot of us, um, you know, have families, but it's also difficult for this many people in a small company to be away from the office. Knowing that, um, I guess it kind of sets the, the, the conditions that we have to be in physical shape that allows us to knock out over 20 miles a day. So in order to have enough time on the trail, we had to start out really early in the morning um, so that we could get driving down the road and, and to the trailhead in time. We also had to stop along the way to pick up Brennan. So last year, Brennan, he came on the Uinta Highline Trail with us. This time, he didn't attempt the trail, but he did agree to, to help us out with shuttling so we would have vehicles and, and people to pick us up at each end of the Highline Trail. So on this trip, we brought Tyler, our VP of Operations, Jason, our boss, the founder of Outdoor Vitals, Brigham, an Army veteran, and our product designer, Derek, our director of marketing, the most laid back, easy going person to be on trail with. And we brought Joe, our video and content guy. I usually am the one who's making these these videos. We're gonna start like over here and walk around this. Yep. Through the woods, skirting that direction, and then we'll eventually go over, over one of those woods. passes. I can't tell, it might be that one. What I remember is was starting the trail at about noon, so we'd already lost part of that day um, hiking wise, but because we knew we were fresh legged and ready to go, we still were hoping to hit 20 miles that day. Okay, dude, thanks okay. again. Not Take serious. care. Stay yes. safe. Yes, stay safe. We'll see you later, man. <laughs> I'll pray for no snow. Yes, yeah, thanks, dude. <laughs> We'll need it. Take care, man. Thanks Take for care, guys. Up. We will absolutely need those prayers for us. Coming into this trip, I think everyone had a little bit of some nerves or anticipation for some bad weather. We watched the weather even more closely than before. Uh, we also made sure that we all packed enough cold weather gear. We weren't just going to do the whole thing in short shorts and trail runners. Well, as we get closer, the forecast said that, you know, we might have one or two days of good weather, but then it was supposed to turn into rain and snow and just, just terrible weather. But at that point, there was nothing that we could do to change the dates. Our schedules had already been booked out for the summer and there was no way we were gonna all align like that again. And so our goal was to just get up and over Anderson Pass and Kings Peak as fast as possible so that we didn't have to deal 
uh, with the issues that we had the previous year. It's just a beautiful drive and we got there, it was a beautiful morning. I think everybody was in like energized and in good spirits. The trail started out quite high. When you start on the west end of the High Line, you start at a place called Hayden Pass and you're already close to uh, tree line. You're already above 10,000 feet. Wait, what just happened? No, I thought that was two left arrows. Regan was wrong. Like, <laughs> two left arrows? Right? Oh, it's a confusing, navigation confusing thing. navigational moment. Do you guys know which way to Flaming Gorge? <laughs> this way? You can't see a lot because you're kind of walking through forest, but the air is crisp, it's fresh, and the sky was blue, and um, you know, it was just enjoyable. It was just good to be out in the Uinta Mountains again. We go into our first burn area and it is haunting. These dead black trees everywhere and then sometimes these just bright, beautiful purple flowers with these like mountain lakes you could see and then the big peaks up in the background. We were all just like antsy about this entire hike. We're just very excited for it. And I felt like I was keeping up with the group just fine. So in preparation for this trip, the things that we started last summer, a lot of trail running, upping our mileages, things like that. You know, now we were doing that for two years in a row. So I would say that a, a, the majority of us were probably coming into this hike in even better shape. The 100 mile framework that we wrote, Kaysen and I tested all through the spring. And then we did a test trip on the Appalachian Trail, which was another 100 miles in three days and two half days. Trail running and hiking every week. We were doing multiple shakedown trips to make sure that our gear was dialed and our nutrition was dialed. I run, I do a lot of training hikes, and I spend quite a bit of time in the gym. Running on the trails, on the streets as much as I can, hiking with loads. I'm just trying to get my body ready to, to, to really conquer the Uinta Highline Trail. They did the, the original Uinta Highline. I made the big, huge video that we that we put out for that thing. I was excited at the fact that they were gonna try it again and I wanted to go along with them and I did my absolute best to be in shape for this. All right, today is the day I run a 5K for the first time in my life. I used to be uh, really overweight. I had been on a health journey, a slow one over the last seven years. The Uinta to Highline Trail was a great opportunity for me to attempt to get into running shape. I have to be able to keep up with these guys who were able to do a marathon a day and were trail running all the time and doing all these crazy backpacking trips. I started with like a 5k running plan. Within a couple weeks I was able to run a mile non-stop which I literally, this isn't hyperbole, I had never ran a mile non-stop. We started getting closer and closer uh, to, to the dates and I started doing trail runs, doing longer hikes, and eventually did a shakeout hike where, you know, I was took all the gear that I was gonna take with me on the high line and I did like a 27 mile hike and I was able to do it and I wasn't it wasn't terrible the next day and I felt like I was ready for the high line. Which way do you choose to cross? the water. Oh, I just drifted off the back of the group. So I thought I'd give a little update. We're five miles in, but uh, just been thinking a little bit about what's to come. So while the weather window looks pretty good, if we hit our marks to get through Anderson Pass, I don't think we're going to be so lucky when it comes to North Pole Pass, but I don't have the heart to tell Joe yet <laughs> for him maybe to piece that together because North Pole Pass is very exposed and nasty as well, so it'll be really interesting to get there. You know it never runs out, Joe? My hoodie never uh, runs out of sunscreen. <laughs> oh, it's a rock check. Oh, no! no! <laughs> Got that on camera. Ah. We stopped and had a little break right before our kind of like ascent towards um, Rocky Sea Pass. Start hitting switchbacks and kind of making a climb. We're hiking through the boulders, coming up on mile seven, and it's really hot. <clears throat> See, if I was a big buck and I wanted the human me to shoot me, I'd bend <laughs> down at the base of that <laughs> rock face with the big yeah. one yellow flaps. <laughs> That was the point where I felt like, okay, we're in it now. We're like, we're, we're in it because that's where you get 
um, into onto a, a pass, you know, above the tree line, and you can start to look out and see. Um, if you look to like the west, you could see the, the the backside of the Wasatch Mountains and Mount Timpanoga. So that's like another like prominent mountain along the Wasatch Range. That's Mount Timpanoga is way way out there. How many miles do you think? <laughs> Mount Timpanoga's seventy-five. <laughs> Holy smokes! You're saying we gotta cross that basin today? Is that, is that right, Captain Morgan? We, we get to cross that basin today. We have the opportunity to cross this basin. The wow. Great, great privilege. Look. The great wow. privilege of crossing this basin in which I can see seven lakes so far. Before today, actually before this week, like last week, what's the farthest you've ever hiked in a day? Probably 13 miles. 13 miles. 13 and a half. Okay. What's the farthest trip you've done? Around 30 miles, a little over that. 30, 30 miles. So we're shooting for 20 to 25 a day and a total of about 110 miles. How are you feeling like that's going to go? I, I'm feeling well. I'm hoping that it goes well. <laughs> I'm feeling a little bit of uh, annoyance in my hip. That's a little concerning. But uh, otherwise, it feels good. We stopped there, had some lunch, kind of refueled, and, and just took it all in. And, and so at this point, I was I just I was very content and happy to be back in the Uintas. After Rocky Sea Pass, we we go down into another basin, and this basin we'd been talking about all day. We had heard reports of a burn area, which it definitely was a burn area. And what we were planning on doing was actually hiking around the burn area, um, adding a few miles to to the route. There's a a good chance the trail is covered in deadfall and burn remnants and so most people are going doing like a four mile loop that goes around the burn on previous trips like we we've, we've had Taysom take us through some trails in burn areas where he was sure there was a, a trail and it did not turn out well a lot of scrapes and a lot of discomfort my personal preference is typically to go through the fires, but I very carefully let them, you know. As we looked at it closer and closer, we could see like fresh tracks of a good amount of people who had been going through the tall green grass and, and we felt like it was a route that was being used enough to not be too much of an issue. So we decided to go through the burn and save ourselves some miles. So there's a confluence right there. So we can get water here, but it looks like we follow that up a ways. Then we kind of cut over and we should have water. So I would say if you're out of water, filter like one liter. There were a couple spots where the trail wasn't there anymore. Tell us uh, which fork the sign says we should take. The sign. Well, I think <laughs> this bolt is pushing this way, but I don't want to go that way. So I think it's going to come us that way. Dang. What about Google? hard logic to argue with. It really wasn't that much worse than the rest of the trail. <laughs> Is it worth the shortcut? Totally. Yeah, totally. I almost got bit by a fire smoke rat. The climb up and out of the burn, I think we all started to kind of feel the elevation and the length of the day a little more and we knew that we still had uh, to cross another smaller basin and get to where we were hoping to camp, which was the back side or the east side of Dead Horse Pass. No matter how many times we do big days like this, every day is still hard, but i uh, feeling pretty good. Any uh, observations on how the other team members are feeling? Yeah, I think um, Taysom's dealing with a little bit of residual uh, pain from his ultra marathon last weekend so seven days ago for however long it was and he's got a little bit there um i think joe's a little nervous but he's doing fine so all in all i think we're in pretty good shape i started to get a little bit of knee pain right about mile 13 and then i started to feel kind of the edge of my endurance reach for it <laughs> Yeah. 
Bring them. Are you uh, getting nervous at all for anyone in our party? Are you, think, are you thinking we're in a good spot still? I think we were starting to to just cross our fingers. Well, I got good news. It's leveling off. Won't be as steep after this point. And then we'll get a little bit of flat walking before dinner and the pass. Like but I think we're out of the dern, yeah. But did what I say dern? The dern. <laughs> we're officially out of the dern now. We're slowing down and slowing down and, and we finally decide, you know what? We got to eat some dinner. We're kind of hungry. At this point it was 5. It was pretty much a good time for us to eat dinner. So we did, we stopped by a little a little pond, leaned up against some rocks, took off our packs. I ended up kind of taking a little nap. Oh baby, dinner time. Looks like I've been looking forward to that since we left the vehicle. It's a right. type of movie spoon. Why are you burning it? I'm burning it. Because that's how we test things. <laughs> because Put it through the, ringer. the top of this bag came unsealed and started leaking water on me. So I am heat pressing it to see if I can seal it. Some trail welding. Trail welding. Ah. And I think it's gonna work. It's just on the west side of Dead Horse Pass. Don't think you can ask for much more scenery in a dinner location. Had our dinner, um, woke Derek up from his nap on a rock and uh, kept kept going. And I remember this was probably one of the most memorable parts of the entire trip. We're slowly climbing up and through this pass called Dead Horse Pass. And the trails, you know, winding and you're climbing up higher and they've got these big, huge, expansive green meadows down below. And it was just a, just, just a phenomenal, beautiful experience. We just hit mile 17. According to my watch, we've been saturated with sweat because it was quite a hot day. So now it's starting to feel a little chilly. And we're trying to get at least three more miles and to get over that pass and down kind of to the bottom of the next one before we have to call it quits for the day. I think that's going to be a pretty difficult push for us. To cap it all off, once you got into Dead Horse Pass and you could look through to the other side, it was probably one of the most memorable views I've ever had in all of my hiking experience. The edge of the world. Nice wobbly legs. This is why we do it, Joe. We will taste of this. It's a big thing. And also you forget how late, how tired you You forget, was. yeah, you forget that. <laughs> it goes away. <laughs> it goes away. The lighting, the basins, everything about it was, was just beautiful. That being said, though, it's getting dark now and we have to drop off this, basically, a cliff. We're looking down and we're saying, how the heck are we supposed to get off of this, you know? Um, you couldn't really even see the trail from where we were taking a lot of these photos and we were we were quite concerned. 18 miles in, going over a way bigger and gnarlier pass than the map made it look like. It's freaking steep right here. And here's where I have to stop filming because it's too slippery. Well, sure enough, it is what we would call, what I call a goat or a sheep trail. I mean, I think the livestock, um, specifically if you've ever seen goat or sheep in these type of mountains, they can climb up anything. And I'm about 90% sure they created this trail. It's, you know, maybe wide enough to get your two feet side by side if they're touching, you know, in the trail at any given time. It's loose, it's talus. Um, and so coming down that in the dark was, was rough. I was already pretty tired on the way up and then on the way down uh, Dead Horse Pass, my legs were turning to jelly. They call that pass Dead Horse Pass, you know? And I could see more than one horse probably slipping and falling on that throughout, you know, the history of the trail. It, it was treacherous. We almost had, you know, a Dead Joe Pass 
a few times. I was hiking behind Joe. He placed his foot, you know, just barely to the side of that six inch little flat spot. And you'd see his foot slide and his trekking pole go down as he'd brace himself and just barely catch himself. And I don't think he was the only one. Just switch back after switch back. And, and now it was actually getting like pretty dark. <laughs> and, uh, so people are getting their headlamps out. Where are we? We're at Dead Horse Lake. We just came down Dead Horse Point. So day one uh, ended up being just under 19 miles and we had 4,100 feet of elevation gain in that half day hike. So it was a fairly strenuous start to the week. I could have, I could have done 20. Could have done 20? Yeah, like this. It could have done 20. A little bit less than we were originally hoping. We did get through the passes that we wanted to get through. So that was a good thing, but uh, we made it through the day. That was, a, that was a big win. No one was feeling sick. No one was really having egregious headaches or anything like that. And I think everyone was going to bed fairly well hydrated. So I had a pretty bright outlook on, on that side of things. So it's morning of day two. I think we're gonna pack up quick and hit the trail. We're gonna stop for breakfast a couple of miles down the, down the trail, get moving just first thing. Woke up, packed up our stuff, and we were like greeted by a gorgeous morning. I came over this morning, like before the sun was out, yeah. and it was super blue. Like just, just like blue lake. Show us where we came down, partly in the dark. So, that big shady cliff on the left. Big flat one. The big flat one that's all completely in the shade. Just to, just past that is where we started coming down. It was zigzag straight down, all that really steep, loose dirt and rock. Joe was walking in front of me and he was slipping and sliding. I would say about 40 feet into our journey to Anderson Pass, which is where we were trying to get to for that day. That's when my knee started to scream. My right knee, I believe it was, was just not cooperating. And I immediately started the day being, again, the slow hiker in the group. Definitely taking some time to get the legs warmed up, for me at least, after coming off that ultra last weekend. Uh, coming downhill is a little painful for me, but everything else is feeling good. I think Joe's doing pretty good as well. He's behind me. He's Woke up with a little bit of knee pain once we started down the trail and hopefully that'll dissipate for him. But uh, yeah, my experience has been start walking, get the muscles loosened up and moving again and then sometimes that pain starts to subside. So far, no one is really suffering from altitude sickness, which is a huge relief. We were on the trail by about 7.30 this morning and hiked about a mile and a half and then stopped for breakfast and then fill up water before we go up and over Red Knob Pass, um, which is behind me somewhere over there. Ended up about a mile short yesterday, so hopefully we can make that up in the end. Um, the itinerary has us going to the base of Anderson Pass on the west side. That'll be about 20 miles. Um, I'm actually a bit hopeful that we can have good weather and have good energy and uh, maybe get up over Anderson Pass today and kind of make up for some lost ground. That last reflection of the stream you see is just right above that. I think we've got a moose. There's a moose. I was, uh, I was limping pretty good, and when we started the ascent for the pass that seemed to never end, I started to get in a bit of a funk. Everything was hurting. I was super tired from the day before, and I suddenly felt the pressure of not only doing the miles, not only trying to keep up with the guys, which was an immense pressure, but also the fact that I was expected to be filming as much as I could. I know at that point, Joe was starting to feel it a lot more. Uh, that climb was definitely a really steep, tricky climb. And so it was sucking a lot of energy out of everyone. Red Knob Pass is extremely deceiving, at least in my mind. It just didn't end because it, it came up to a shelf and then took a right and then kept going up to another shelf. And um, so the pass looked half as, half as long as it actually was. Almost 12,000. Based off of names, I expected nothing out of this pass. I expected it to be like this little lump in the road type of uh, pass. It ended up being a pretty serious pass. You know, it was, it was, it was a decent climb. You really. Um, couldn't downplay that, but also it was very pretty. Had had awesome vantage points. Yeah, I see the, there's a white and black horse down there. 
I don't know if they were called Golden Delicious or yeah. Yellow Delicious. Golden Delicious so are way good. What you should do with any apple, light a fire, like just like you're having a cookout, um, and then ground up a bunch of graham crackers and cinnamon and brown sugar and mix it all together so it's like this like graham cracker sugary powder stuff. And then peel an apple and stick it on your skewer and roll it around in that powder and roast it. And you bite off the whole top layer and then it's all juicy again. So you roll it around again in the- And then roast it And again. roast it again. And you're just basically eating off the roasted graham cracker, apple pie tasting stuff one layer at a time and it's really good. All we talk about on trail is food. <laughs> Got up to the top, had a little break, and then we could see down a really long basin. And we knew that we had to get all the way across that before two in the afternoon in order to be on pace to make it all the way. I think Taysen went first and then I went after him. Once again, like I had been exhausted on the hike up and then going down that pass, my joints started to hurt again um but then we finally made it to the flat area at the bottom and we were going across this big huge basin this big huge valley all these sheep all over the place i started to feel better around then and i felt like i could hike at the pace that was just as fast as the other guys so i, I did ran into a few hikers ran into someone who who knew us who was out there you know filming his own videos for his own channel which was cool to see and say hi about five miles into the day um I think we're making okay time and we're kind of hiking down part of Lake Fork Basin and we'll go around the mountain and uh, yeah feeling feeling good uh, energy wise calorie wise so it kind of took us into some lower elevation like around 10,000 feet and it's interesting how much warmer it gets like going from a pass to the forest at 10,000 feet like it gets like I remember that part being like pretty hot all right, Taysen, fall in the water so that it's more exciting. Started getting in pain again, and I started to slow down again, and I was not talking very much, and I was honestly in my head, I was having this, kind of this crisis about how fast the other guys were expecting to go and how fast I knew I could go. So I was just hoping that I would get another break and my body would decide to cooperate. I was starting to lose a lot of hope and it was around, it was only like mile 10 or so. We were gonna wait till mile 12 to have lunch and then um, they saw how slow I was going. We decided to take a little bit earlier lunch. We stopped by this, this creek and uh, had some lunch. I did just figure all the mileage out for the day. <laughs> We're uh, 14 to the base of Anderson. That was probably where I started to get a little more concerned about Joe because at that point he wasn't really wanting to eat the food that he had packed. And that's usually not a good sign. All right, we just had a very enjoyable lunch. I think we're all satisfied. Joe took off up the trail ahead of us, but we're gonna go see if we can catch him on this climb. We've got about an 800 foot climb. Then a lot more country to cover, and then we go through Porcupine Pass. Today has been extremely enjoyable. A little downhill. The pass that we went through, Red Knob, was really pretty. Um, nothing to complain about out here. But uh, I guess all that can change with one, one cloud coming through. <laughs> From my experience hiking kind of with Joe and around Joe and trying to ask as many probing questions as I could, he was in a, a lot of pain. He was grimacing a lot and I was, I was trying to ask him, you know, what's going on? How are you feeling? And it was, it was never like, oh, I can't breathe or anything like that. It wasn't like elevation sickness. It was just that this is a lot of miles. It's a fast pace. My feet are hurting more and more. My legs are more and more tired every climb. That had just progressively gotten worse from the end of day one, climbing up the next pass, climbing up this next little section. After walking with Joe for a little bit, I kind of went ahead and started talking with the other guys in the group and, and just wanted to, 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 you know, see what everyone else was, was thinking and considering. And I think everyone was, was on the same page of, of having some, some serious concerns. We went along for another couple of miles at a slower pace. And then at that point we decided to take a break and uh, that's when the day 
got a lot less comfortable, I guess. This conversation is the exact one we had with Brennan last year, which is, he's like, I think I can, can keep going at this speed. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it's... We it's, don't have necessarily... Yeah, like that, the that's the problem. 15 to 15 miles seems easy. I could probably do 20. When you're getting into 25... The farther you push it, the more risk comes into play. Altitude, twisting your ankle from fatigue, loss of focus. I'm uh, feeling that sometimes too. Yeah. I was getting so in my head because I had been hiking alone or I had been behind other people a long ways and I was exhausted and I was trying to get footage all at the same time. All I was thinking was all these like negative thoughts about how I did not want to be there. If I bailed, you know, what would I think of myself? What would other people think of me? If I were to, I've been training for this for nine months and then, you know, I'm just gonna give up on day two. If I quit this, I want it to be known I didn't quit this crying and screaming. <laughs> <laughs> no. Ah. Hard choice, man. That's all I've been thinking is like, God, I just went the normal rate most hikers do. You're only gonna go slower from here, right? Like yesterday you were doing three, we were doing three a lot of the time we are moving. Today we are down at two. Joe could have kept going at his own pace, but then he would have been alone and he wouldn't have made uh, the same benchmarks that we are trying to make. We still have 80 miles left, right? Of the high line? Yeah. 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 So it's like, that's even to finish on Friday or Saturday, that would be what? We'd still have to be doing 20, over 20 a day to finish Saturday. We talked through a, a few different options. Just continue with them at my own pace and then have someone else, you know, pick me up at the at the end of probably what would be a six or seven day version of the hike. Um, I am worried about the weather too, because if we don't get over North Pole before it gets sour, <laughs> that's gonna be bad. On a slower timeline, I would be in the highest basin in the entire route between the highest passes in the entire route, which would be Anderson and North Pole Pass. And that's when the bad weather was supposed to roll in. How can I make myself look good though? I <laughs> bail at the same time. <laughs> you know what? I had eight months of training and I don't, I just think I would have to train for another year. I don't know if I'd want to put in any more time than I did. I put in a lot of time. Year over year, you get better at endurance. Being regularly used to doing a lot of backpacking, like with backpack on your back, covering, you know, 15 miles in a day, getting up and doing it like the next day. The more times you do that, the more that this is second nature. So essentially we handed him our extra Garmin in reach and said, let's get this synced up and, and uh, choose your exit plan. And Joe chose to go back down a trail to a lake called Moon Lake. Be safe, get some food while you're sitting there eating. Think of us. And uh, good work, finishing your longest hike ever and the shortest amount of time ever. Okay. Good. Yep. See you. See you, Joe. See you, Joe. Good luck. And here we go this way, at least 12 more miles to over there. So I'm about a mile into my walk of shame. I worked really hard to get into shape for this thing. Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't quite enough. The, the lack of resting time in between uh, all the mileage and the elevation and all that, it, it adds up. These other guys that work at OV are freaks. That's the second time we've had to have that conversation on trail. Yep. On this trail. On this trail. And it wasn't any easier this time than the last time. I feel like you guys, you know, let me have to take charge in those conversations. You're like, pretty sure I did initiate the Brennan one and this one, so. I didn't Two times, I've done it twice, so the next time I'm gonna designate someone else to have to have that conversation. Well, that's why you get paid the big bucks. <laughs> <laughs> I think Brigham is on to the biggest thing, which is in the framework, in the very beginning, it's decide where you're at and decide what's possible to get to. Joe wasn't deciding what was possible to get to. We decided that for him if he wanted to come. And I just think there wasn't enough time. We probably spent an hour or a little more like in our in our debate on on what joe was going to do so then when he decided to turn around we were we were bummed out but also we knew 
we were behind schedule. We had to put the hammer down. I swear it felt like we were about running to get to the base of Anderson Pass by the end of that night. On this big open plateau that looked like a field almost sloping up, just miles of this gradual uphill. It was deceiving because we thought, oh, that's kind of flat looking, but after hiking on it, you're like, wow, my legs are burning. We had a really good pace going, like three, three and a half miles per hour pace that we just pulled up this, this basin for hours. We're actively cruising through what I feel like is the longest basin ever. This is where we're headed, and it does not look like there's an exit. It's crazy. You ready for it, Derek? Just juiced up. This is Porcupine Pass, and you probably can't see it in the camera, but I can see the trail right here. So it goes where Brigham and Derek are, goes up over to there, and then it goes all the way up like that. Porcupine Pass. In the books. 12,037 feet according to my watch. And uh, we crushed it. We held like a 25 minute mile pace up and over it. And uh, I think it's mostly because I led it. We just tied a rope to my waist and then everyone else held on. And then we Either literally dragged me up. Yep. I didn't even walk. So now we're going down this basin and we're going to crush more passes. Got to go across over all that, past Tungsten, and basically the same distance over to the base of Anderson Pass, below King's Peak. So five more miles to go. It's probably about, what is it, six o'clock, Derek? Feeling pretty good still. We just stopped and had dinner. Um, calves are still feeling just a little bit of tightness. So I'm just stretching those out every opportunity I can. Um, Energy is still pretty good. Tungsten Pass sounds scary because it's called a pass. It looks more like a, a little bit of a hill. We're gonna go camp up in that basin. Clear up there still. Which still looks like a lot of miles, Tyler. Yeah. <laughs> we got lakes in every direction. Poison lakes. Are they all poisoned or? I think there's that drain that came out of it. So we already drank the poison water. Yeah, they put the sign conveniently after we've gone through the whole basin to drink the water that it was poisoned. Yeah, they only are helping the people going west. This would be a good test for Catadin, Catadin's filter. Ouch. Catadin. Catadin. This is why we don't let Derek in the lead right before mealtime or bedtime. It's making me walk 17 minute miles here, 16 sometimes, and he's pulling on me still. <laughs> Pretty soon I'm gonna have to start jogging. We are getting close to the end of day two and my legs are getting tired. We've gone just over 20 miles. I think we're gonna get 22 or um, 22 or 23 miles in today. Uh, I'm, I'm getting pretty excited to sit in my tent and crawl in and fall asleep. <laughs> but this has been amazing. Um, we're, we've been through so many basins and over oh, a bunch of passes already. And I mean, look at that. You can kind of see that behind me. This is beautiful. You just can't make up stuff like this. How pretty it is up here. If you've never been, you need to, you need to get out there and see this kind of country be humbled by the altitude and the grand nature of how big this country is and it'll change you. Just like our normal hiking days, we showed up at the base of Anderson Pass right at last light. Like barely enough light to kind of like see where the bushes were. And then we had to set up the majority of our camp in the dark. All right, I think this is camp for the night. Camping below King's Peak right there. We are at 22.6 miles. So that's a wrap on the day. Did another 12 and a half since we left Joe and we were trucking for sure. I think we're all excited to sleep. So we'll find a flat spot and get the 40th set up.
or as I call it, my mini cabin. I literally slept for 13 hours. <laughs> it was one of the best nights of sleep I've ever had in the backcountry. I put on some podcasts and I, at a very relaxed pace, enjoying myself, went the, I think it was 12 miles out to, to Moon Lake where my parents were there and they, they, they congratulated me. I, I had done, I believe I had tracked 46 miles in the three days, which I felt like was, was pretty good. And I was feeling really good at that point. I had almost felt like, like after that night of rest, I would be able to be just fine and be able to do um, the rest of the trip. It's day three and I'm trying to get to the summit of Kings Peak, highest peak in Utah, a little over 13,500 feet. No one else wanted to do it with me, so I had to wake up at 5.30 to get an hour head start on everyone else. I know that like Derek and Tayson were, were wanting to get up there, but also nervous about day three because day three was going to be our biggest miles and our two biggest passes. But I just couldn't leave Kings Peak alone. Like when, when you're that close to the highest point in Utah and you don't go up there, that seems um, like the a waste of a special moment. It's just a pile of rocks that are just wedged together. I just gotta get to right there. It's freaking steep. My legs feel pretty heavy. 44 miles into the Uinta Highline. And I made it to King's Peak. It's 8.05 in the morning. There's like zero wind. And uh, it's like a ridiculously beautiful morning. I can't believe how pretty it is. This is incredible. So on the first night of the trip, I made a few um, discoveries. It's dark and we're trying to set up our tents. So I go to pull out my headlamp and I switch it on and and light shows up for about three seconds and it just dies. In the morning when I was packing my stuff all back up I noticed there's this bulge in the backpack and I'd actually left a power bank in there from uh, a trip I just went on just recently. I'm packing an extra heavy power bank and my headlamp is dead, but that's all right. That just means I have more uh, ability to charge my phone if I just use my phone light. All right, here we go. Morning of day two. Time to go right up that line to Anderson Pass. I've made it my own personal vendetta a little bit of, of just conquering this stupid pass in Kings Peak because in 2018, we came and did this hike. I had been dropping weight and improving my health, I guess you could say. And we went and did Kings Peak and I didn't do great. I was definitely feeling the elevation. I was probably not as hydrated as I could have been. I remember like I had been training really hard that year and I'd probably lost already 15 pounds when we went on this trip. But I remember very distinctly as I was climbing up, I remember watching Derek and Darren in our office just walking away from me on the hill. Like I could not keep up with them. And I remember being so frustrated by that. So going into it this year, it's like, okay, Anderson Pass like kicked my butt physically one year. The next year weather kicked my butt. So I was very excited to get up and through Anderson Pass. And I started to climb up the trail and I realized like, man, I am in way, way better shape than I thought I was or that I could even be at this and and I, as I started hiking up, I thought, you know what? I bet I could do this entire climb without stopping once. Just like a personal little victory. And so I remember I pushed for that and was able to do it. It was pretty cool to get to the top of Anderson Pass and just be like, man, what a difference four years can make. And especially what a difference two years of trail running and that type of cardio and improvement can make. Yeehaw, done. One year later. I would say I was probably going three times as quickly up that mountain. I think it's always good for people to stop and just take those little victories of year over year progress because sometimes progress doesn't come week after week or sometimes you can't even notice it month after month. But when you get the opportunity to, to stop and reflect on some of those victories, it's well worth doing. You can see all the way to basically the plain out to Wyoming. This was 
100% a different experience compared to the year before. It was clear and it wasn't even windy. It was beautiful. So for day three, we knew that we had to get up and over Anderson Pass, which was a 12,000 foot plus pass. And then we had to go all the way the length of Painter's Basin, which is one of the biggest, prettiest and roughest basins up there and up and over the second biggest pass on the entire trail, which is called North Pole Pass. We throw our packs on and start hiking down, but almost right when we're ready to go, another group of people gets to the top of Anderson Pass coming from the other direction. I expected there to be more people there because it's a more popular thing to do to go, oh, I'm gonna go climb King's Peak. But there was definitely more people than expected. And what was even more blind, mind blowing was how many of them knew who we were. Yeah. Yeah. I hope it was good. Yes, great. <laughs> That's all been freaking heavy, dude. I don't know what you <laughs> It was really fun to get to talk to people who have taken our gear all over the place and see so many people who recognized us. Um, but at the same time, we're like, we have to go from Anderson Pass to North Pole Pass, which is 26 miles. And they're the two highest passes on the entire trail. And we have to get over both of them before the storms come. We were really excited to talk to people using our gear, seeing how they were using it out on the trail. We we're also really wanting to get going. <laughs> Somewhere just behind us uh, is where we decided to turn back last year. And this river right here was like massive and overflowing. And uh, so now officially we've completed the Highland Trail in sections. Yep, we're getting <laughs> off trail today, guys. Got it, we're just hiking out. <laughs> yep, pretty cool though. I'm enjoying this much more than last time. Anders Basin is, it's another long, like, it's a pretty big basin that you have to go all the way through. A lot of it is in and out of forest. At that point, we were in a lot of trees in the bottom of this valley, and a lot of us kind of got quiet at that point for the, pretty much the entire afternoon. There wasn't a ton said. In the previous year, it was just non-stop running water. Like, the entire trail was just a creek bed. Doing it while it was dry was nice, but it was also extremely rough and rocky. We didn't really realize how bad the trail was in this section. Here's the real question. Is Brigham gonna cross this log like this again? One foot, you know, just, just those little, or is he just gonna tightrope it and just go for it? It's better for him, Peter. Good back <laughs> You know, one thing I really appreciated about the lunches that I made, like I made these tortilla things that were like, that had cheese, salami, and then I brought mustard and mayo packets. And those were so satisfying. And uh, like, I, they were, like, I'm just so glad I did. Like, it's just, it's a memorable thing for me. All right, we're about 10 miles into the day on day three. We're kind of working our way around Painter Basin towards North Pole Pass in about eight miles or so. Hoping to get up over that with plenty of time and not get obliterated by a storm. I think we're keeping a good pace and I think everybody's going as good as can be expected, which is pretty good. A few more people pass us and go in the opposite direction. A lot of people looked at us real funny seeing us hiking the wrong way. Just coming up to where we're gonna have dinner at 18 miles on the day. Pretty sure these guys are trying to kill me. <laughs> Been having some leg issues from last week's ultra and it kind of flared back up where it's like a low shin splint and a lot of tightness and pain. But uh, yeah, looking forward to getting some dinner. Well, we just got to Fox Lake, found this cool cabin. I think Tyler's gonna go live in it. Mm. You got my hopes up for pizza too much. We get to Fox Lake where 
we had planned on having dinner. And so it was a little bit early, it was like 4.30ish, and we're like, well, we could eat, we're hungry, and, and we get to where there's a little stream that runs into the lake. And, and that's where we actually had dinner, right by the stream, we could filter some moving water, and we could also look ahead and see the next pass that we had to try to climb up and over that night, which was the North Pole Pass. Today, I started by doing Queen's Peak, and uh, the rest of the crew didn't want to do it because of the extra miles and time, and I don't blame them. My feet are killing me now. I'm right at 20 miles on the day, but you put them in an ice cold creek and they instantly start to restore. And so it is super dang cold and a little uncomfortable, but I know what good it will do. And hopefully that will do enough good for us to beat this storm up North Pole Pass. Before the trip even started, the weather forecast was saying like, this was the afternoon that we'd probably start getting some rain. And then the next day we were supposed to get rain too. You could see these pretty big dark clouds coming our way. I just remember watching the clouds and it never, the storm never hit us. It almost seemed like the closer the, the big ominous cloud got, the less threatening it got and the more it broke up. And it really was like, a few raindrops like that hit. Between lunch and dinner, I had started to have things kind of change for me. My stomach started to turn on me where I didn't want to eat, which then when you start not wanting to eat, you start to fill calorie walls and lack of energy. I was essentially starting to build a bit of a mountain for myself. By dinner time, I was struggling and I knew North Pole Pass was going to be a battle for me. We're on our final approach to North Pole Pass. Second biggest pass on the high line. Got a little cocky with how fast I was moving for for the first part of the day. The soles of my feet are paying for it. And I'm appreciating the slower pace now. Ending part of North Pole Pass starts. You can see we've made it way the crap up here. And now on the horizon, you can see that giant cairn. Well, when we get to that, there's more climbing after that. It's a it's a strenuous pass, it's very steep. There's a lot of sections that just go straight up and don't have the best switchbacks. Probably made it 20%, 25% of the way up, and I was starting to stop pretty frequently and I was just, just flat out struggling. I can't even put my, my, my thumb essentially on exactly what it was. It was it was lack of energy, it was, I could tell I was low on hydration. I could tell it was just, it, and I just felt nauseous. Like I was going to throw up. I let Tyler get in front of me and I just like had to make this mini goal of stay on Tyler's heels. Here's what I was talking about. Now all of a sudden, as we keep climbing, we can see three cairns. All right, we're to the two cairns we could see on the horizon, and guess what? Two more cairns. It's not like most of the others in the Uintas where it's like straight up and straight down. North Pole is like this huge, round, um, like log-shaped ridge line. And now we can see the polar bear-sized cairn, which is why Taysom calls this polar bear pass. Here we go, Polar Bear Pass, in the books. Woo! Just gotta still cross all of us. I think that was the hardest pass of the entire trip for me. These guys right here, they don't leave anything that can be done today for tomorrow. So, they've pushed, I've pushed, and I uh, had a polar opposite experience last time I was standing right here. It was raining and I felt like I was cruising and on the top of the world. This time, 
beautiful weather and uh, that pass was 10 times harder it felt like <laughs> you never know what you're gonna get up here but yeah I mean all you can do is just eat and hydrate and try to keep yourself in the best position as possible so from here till the end of the day that's my main goal is eat hydrate do everything I can to hit tomorrow running. We made it over North Pole Pass and down to the first bench below it. And I think I'm sitting at 24 or 25 miles. You're 20... 22.2. 22.2. I think I had 22 and a half. <laughs> and now we're arguing about where to camp when we're really tired and Henri and Jason wants to go backwards on the trail yeah, to I camp. Sleep. With that in my back right there? You don't have to sleep on that rock. There's lots of not rock spots. <laughs> Look, you could sleep right there. My tent is all set up. I've got um, top gold and everything set up, but I'm ready to get off my feet. Um, some things that went well today, the weather. The weather worked out really nicely with us. It was a pretty calm evening, but right as we were going to bed, we could see like a whole lot of lightning in the clouds, like way, way, southeast of us. I think we all fell asleep pretty easy with us being tired from the day, but I woke up like around 11 to just like like studio lights like flashing in my eyes. About the time I was like deliriously registering all this, um, it felt like a, you know, like a m giant mass hit my tent and that mass was just wind. It was just like instantaneous. Just, just literally from like a standstill to just this blast of wind and then back to silent, and then another blast of wind, and before I knew it, just this massive flash and crack, uh, what felt like right on top of us. The horizon was just covered with these flashing clouds and lightning bolts. I actually like tried to take my trekking poles down to like lower my tent and, and lower my overall um, exposure to the lightning, but then the wind was so bad, my tent was like getting ripped all over the place. So I, I ended up putting it back up. But then I was like having these weird, like sleepy, not totally coherent thoughts of like the tent fabric was blowing in on my head because the wind was so strong and I was wearing a fleece beanie. And so for some reason I was like, what if this causes like friction that attracts, you know, the lightning bolts. And so I was like trying to like put my head on the floor, like as low as I could. And then I was like thinking, well, maybe I'll just take off the fleece beanie. That's going to be the thing that keeps me safe. I start wondering, well, I'm not sure what to do here. If I stand up and start running, like we're in enough of a little bowl that I'd have to go up higher before I could go down further. And that would just put me in a worse condition to, you know, hike. I start just trying to like not touch the sides of my tent because I'm in a single person tent and there's a trekking pole here on the side of me and a trekking pole here. And I'm like, if I stay in the middle and lay flat, just don't touch my trekking poles, I think that's my best chance. <laughs> so that's how I laid for a good hour, hour and a half. I've got carbon fiber poles. Well, they conduct electricity. I'm thinking, oh, my Garmin end reach is at the top of my tent. I should probably just pull that down so it's, so it's not anything that could be struck. You know what I mean? Because it was literally just shaking your soul. I mean, it was shaking the ground, but it was shaking you. And I started to think about all sorts of things and why I, like, this is on me. If someone gets struck by lightning, like I'm, a, I'm the owner of this company. You know what I mean? Like I brought them up here in a sense. And it was a very long hour. I never stopped counting lightning for over an hour. And you're tired. You just hiked 20 something miles that day in the high country. You're, you're just so physically exerted, but you can't sleep because every time you even start to think about drifting off, the ground shakes again. And, um, it was just a very, very long hour of my life. And I was so relieved that it finally left and we were all still alive and breathing. I slept very little the night after the biggest day on the trail. Made it through, we're all still here. And hopefully today is gonna be nice weather. So I guess we'll find out. Beautiful morning up here to 11,500 feet. What did you do to handle the lightning, Derek? I prayed. I prayed. I prayed and didn't touch my tent poles. <laughs> <laughs> I pinched my tent pretty high so I could see the storm like through this gap um, on the vestibules on both sides. And I saw the lightning strike like straight up above your tent at the very top. And uh, I was counting the whole time. Every yeah. flash, I was counting. 
I think the closest was like about three seconds. Day four was one of the most epic mornings I've ever had because I was still alive. <laughs> So day four uh, was going to be about a 24 mile day. We knew that it was going to be a tough one. We also knew that down from North Pole Pass, past Chipetta Lake, and then around Gabbro Pass, that we would start to near tree line again and be through the majority of the 80 miles that are above 10,000 feet. And then also at around mile 20 of that day, we knew we would hit our last water for a 20 mile dry section. We wanted to just push as far as we could because Again, this group, we kind of feed off of each other. So pushing far that day meant that there was less miles to cover on Friday, which meant that maybe we could finish the trail a little bit earlier and get on our way home a little bit earlier. And also closer to the pizza that we were all starting to talk about that we hoped would be at the trailhead at the end. We started out by down climbing from North Pole Pass down to Chipetta Lake. That was where we decided to have a bigger breakfast and uh, there was an outhouse there. There's the one bathroom you get to use on the High Line if you run out of toilet paper. This is your one chance. <laughs> What's your friend's name, Alice, Brigham? Alice, pat him on the nose. Uh, Wanda. Hey, Wanda. Down about five miles, about five miles into the day. Probably do about 20 to 25 miles today. Feeling pretty good. Any of my little tenders or soreness or aches that I've had aren't really getting any worse. At this point we're in some nice meadows and some valleys and basins and it's fairly flat and relatively easy for a number of miles. Mile 10 on day four. Getting ready to climb another pass. Then we start climbing again. Gabbro is another pass kind of similar to the North Pole Pass where it's not like straight up and straight down. It was a lot more gradual going up. Ooh, another one down, boys. No matter how many you do, you always feel better at the top. There is a bypass trail that kind of stays higher along the side of the basin. So we, we skirted that lake and stayed kind of high. Because we were kind of side hilling a little bit going around the side of this big bowl, I was experiencing some pain um, in my hip, which was actually weird. I never really had any trouble with it before. That was surprising because he never usually shows like any weakness when we're out there. Brigham finally decided he had enough of us and he's out of here. Clear the heck up almost to the top of the pass. And there's Derek trucking along, and Taysen and I. Dude, you're out of here, man. Tyler offended up the Taysen and I were just trying to like pace ourselves because uh, we were feeling the fatigue from the previous day. All right, we're just leaving our afternoon, well, 2.30 pit stop. I think we're feeling pretty good. I think we're ahead on mileage. And for the most part, we don't have a lot more climbing today. I'm looking out on the end of the windows right now back there behind me we got lady peak we're headed that direction maybe another hour and a half or so of the high country before we drop down into the woods and finish off the day tomorrow after not too long the trail kind of tapers out and and uh disappeared we're looking around i'm looking around well, where'd the trail go um and i see it down below me all of a sudden i'm like what how did they get down there all right here's the non Trying not to lose too much information. It's pretty special. So we start picking our way and trying to get down to that lower section of the trail without sliding and falling, um, which was kind of tricky, um, but we did it. Nobody fell, and nobody shoved rocks on top of each other, which was which was good. Welcome to the Highline Trail. Maintain very thorough. Yeah, thankfully there wasn't any insanely steep climbs. I was able to just, just lock in and, and click off the miles and click off these, these basins. I think I was locking in this day to just finish mode, but also in the back of my mind, I had a bit of this somber feeling of like, we will be exiting the high country. All these big, beautiful basins, these big peaks, these granite landscapes that we've been looking at, um, we're going through the last of them today. By the time we got past Lady Peak, 
and started to go down. It was time for dinner and I think a few of us ended up stopping in that area and calling home and and we're like you could tell we were all feeling it a little more because we were like dragging our feet a little more and the phone calls took a little longer than normal. This is where we camped our first night on trail last year and uh, me and Derek were camped right there. We were sharing a two-person tent and then Brennan was camped right here and he was quite sick. So he was throwing up right here and then he'd walk further and throw up over there and he'd go back behind us and throw up. And it was rough. We're less than a day away from the end of the trail at this point. So we're gonna go get some dinner right down here where there's some water, make a plan for the rest of the night. And uh, we're under a day of hiking now at this point. We made it to the last water um, before the big water haul and that was where we decided to have dinner. And of course, that last water was like a pretty terrible water source. It just tastes like cow poop after you filter it. I really don't understand why we would want to sit 3,000 feet lower in the hottest part of the day. I'd rather walk slow tomorrow for less miles than try to walk fast for 25 miles. To me, if we got another four miles in today, I'd feel very confident we could finish by five tomorrow. Um, knowing it's downhill and knowing we don't have someone that's struggling at this point. So I don't think I'm like, I, I don't think I really want to go like if we're sitting at 197, I don't, I wouldn't want to go more than four or five miles at max. But, Tonight uh, we made ourselves get up and do another five or six miles. Stepped in a cow pie. Well, me and Derek are taking a shortcut that um, we thought was dry. Turns out to not be. A lot of it was dry. A lot of it was dry until just barely. <laughs> now it is not dry. By shortcut, I think this is also actually. But this is a very good shortcut. Look how far those guys are back. A cow thought you just got her. We ended up doing over 24 miles on day four, and then we camped in the middle of that 20 mile dry section. It rained on us last night, but sky looks decent today, so should be good. What are you doing? Waving your sticks around. I'm trying to get these to dry off. <laughs> these wave a little harder. Get them on right, Brigham. Gotta do a few more paces. Ah, I see. Just left camp number four on the High Line, and we have about 20 miles to get done by six o'clock tonight. We camped in the dry stretch. We've got about 15 miles to get to water, so we're loaded heavy, but it's really cool, and it feels very refreshing, and hopefully. It'll be a good day. Tyler, what are you uh, doing with your poles there? I'm trying to catch spider webs before they get stuck in my mustache. <laughs> this was it. This is the uh, the last day of the Utah Highline Trail. Trudging our way through it, the trail was like pretty much just solid rock. Brigham just uh, found... Jason just stepped in it and Brigham saw it. <laughs> just found some bear poop. Pretty old though. Uh, we couldn't do anything but talk about pizza and hamburgers and, and all of that. How you feeling? I'm feeling good. I just wish I wanted to eat more food, but nothing sounds good and stomach's kind of just churning. So well, just looking forward to pizza tonight. Everyone was like, all right, Tayson, you make sure that when Brennan gets here to pick us up, there's a lot of pizza in the car. Uh, I'm excited to get some pizza. I don't feel like eating anything either. Except for pizza. Tayson. <laughs> put the final order in um, to Brennan to just stop at Domino's in, in Evanston and buy all the pizza that they had. We're all walking pretty gingerly these last couple of miles. Our feet are pounded and our joints and muscles are about shot. The ground is mostly just dry dirt and rock and uh, it's pretty hot. And the trees are not really tall that provide shade. The trees are long pine needle trees. They're not fir trees, they're, they're an actual pine tree. And a lot of these saplings are like really close to the trail 
and they have these little branches that stick out in the path that you have to walk through. And I, that's my most prominent memory of that day is feeling like I was like being shocked every time my sunburned legs would brush across those needles. Finally, finally um, got down to where we could get water again. We sit down, everything's great, we're all happy. Next thing you know, Brigham is, is bolting. And I don't even remember like who saw them first, but like somebody was like, hornets. While I'm filtering water, like Tayson and Brigham start like running around and yelling. And I'm like, what is going on? And uh, Brigham like, like he's like running and then he looks like he gets shot in the back and kind of like falls forward. Stung the sunburn. Yeah, uh, got me right there in the ankle. Yeah. Uh, took me down. <laughs> <laughs> well, we retreated, but my backpack is still over there. By the time we're done filtering water and taking a little bit of break, this big group of hikers comes. And the first thing we notice is that they're all wearing like outdoor vital stuff. At least a bunch of them were. That's a good looking pack. This is, this is the owner. This is the owner of Outdoor Vitals. <laughs> <laughs> they had a lot of Outdoor Vitals gear. It was cool. They had, they had packs, they had the altitude hoodies, they had Ventuses. Uh, the one guy who was kind of like the organizer of their group was a Live Ultralight member. That was a lot of fun to see him out on the trail and just sparked, you know, some energy again, I would say for us to finish off the trail. I think we still had about five miles to go um, from that point and so get our packs together, warn them of the wasp's nest, and we, we head down the trail. Uh, a couple miles later, we bump into another gentleman who had watched our Highline film from the year previous. Yeah, when we went to the AT, um, <coughs> there's there quite a bit of trail magic, but it was really, it was interesting to learn that a lot of it was put on by churches and, and like oh, organizations really? like that. Cause I was wondering, I'm like, what drives these people to go and do the trail magic, you know? And out there, it seemed to be some of that, but yeah. Colorado trail stuff, that's interesting if you had yeah, a different- On the Colorado trail, probably only on the Colorado trail, we got close to Mount Princeton and Princeton Hot Springs. On the trail, not far from the road, was a bag of weed hanging with a sign on it, you know, for CT hikers. <laughs> you know, we had a great conversation with him, and then we entered the last three miles of, of the death zone. It was just the most miserable three miles of rocky trail, huge round rocks, big step downs when your legs are hurting. You know, my, my, my shin and, and whatnot, and it just drug on forever. I was trying not to look at the maps because I just didn't want to know. All right, guys, it is all downhill from here. We are like two or so miles out from the trailhead. Everyone's feet are hurting. The last meadow of the High Line. I guess the end, it ends in a meadow. I keep thinking, oh man, we're almost there. We're so close, we're almost there. We can hear cars on the highway at the end. I'd say these last five miles were like the miles that never came. They were like, like, it was like we walked, but we weren't covering miles. That's what it felt like. I mean, there's the highway. We hit a dirt road right over there. And it was like a dang train horn or, or else there is a train over there. I think the best thing uh, about the Highline was the day that we had when we dropped off of Dead Horse Pass down into the basin down below. The experience of getting up over a pass and just taking a minute to take in the basin that you just came out of and then the, the one you're about to go into. Being able to do a trail like this in five days and make it work with our family schedules and stuff is a huge highlight. What was the lowest point of the trip for you? Easily the last two miles of the trip were the lowest point. There's always some suffering in any good adventure or any <laughs> any trip that pushes your limits a little. I'm really excited that we were able to get it done and that we were able to do it safely and that the weather held out for us. 
I think it would have been extremely hard to finish in five days if we had any major weather slowing us down. So we hit perfect window this year. See the rain coming in. We just finished, everybody's sprawled out waiting for a ride. These are my MYOG rain pants I made for this trip and didn't use till we finished it. <laughs> he actually does that move a lot on trail. <laughs> So it's not even weird that he just did that, but yeah, there's the, there's the trailhead Solid. and he's finally getting his rain pan on. This is how we celebrate finishing the High Line, hanging out by the bathroom in the rain. Holy cow, that's one swipe? Yeah, one swipe down my shin. <laughs> a lot more where that came from. There's a ride! Oh, there. oh. It was great! It was good, man. It was brutal. Were you guys hungry? Yeah. Pretty hungry, yeah. I'll get my, my pack will get itself. So. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully they're not like super uh and then too you cold. Are you guys? I'm so guys smelly, I wanna give you a hug. I don't care, man. Myself. That's fine. Yeah, I'll give you a hug. I'm in a oh, yeah. I'm in. <laughs> so pumped to see Where's, you, man. Uh, um somebody else get the where's Joe? Your, Joe. We had to boot him. Boot him. Didn't, he couldn't quite make the mileage. It really is a spectacularly beautiful area, and I hope to be able to conquer the High Line on my own someday, maybe at their pace, maybe at a slightly uh, slower pace. <laughs> it was worth it. It was worth It was worth doing that. It kind of boosted my confidence in the sense that I can do really hard things. The number of miles that we covered, not only just being miles, but they were miles of really steep up and down and a ton of elevation was was difficult. All of us felt it by the end. And the way I felt after completing that was just this sense of, of having conquered something so hard made me feel like there's more I can do. The camaraderie that you feel with those that you go through an experience like this with, you really feel um, a lot of pride and, and like a special kind of relationship that you gain by going through something that's that's difficult and amazing, and um, I think that that we don't experience that enough in our day-to-day -day lives. I've talked to, you know, my kids about um, doing the Highline Trail with them, like kind of as a rite of passage. So I've talked to my older daughter when she turns 14. We're going to do the Highline Trail, and so that's going to be like a for each child something we do. This is why you do 100 miles. That's why you do 100 miles. <laughs> put your body through that. Mm -hmm. Well, you guys are probably eight to nine pounds lighter, I bet. Mm -hmm. Probably more. I don't know. I started counting my ribs. That's how many days I've been out. <laughs> <laughs> we made it home finally about 1 a.m. back down to Cedar City here. and We'd done it. We'd completed the Utah High Line Trail. All 110 plus miles of it, and we'd done it in five days. It's like, man, we've been thinking of this for so long. We finally checked it off the bucket list. We uh, did it in a, in a pretty insane, you know, four and a half day type time frame. I would say what I hope by sharing this with other people that they get out of this is just that, that they can go and do things. One, that they can, they can see year over year progress. They might see people go out there and do bigger trips and think, oh, I can never do that. But I promise you that you can. Um, and there's tools out there. There's tools that we try to provide and, and help coaching, you know. We put together programs ourselves that you can look into to, to help. But, you know, never write anything off. Um, if you would have asked me in 2018 if this would have been possible for me to go and do this, I just would have told you no. Like, it wasn't on my radar. You know, I like to hike 10 to 15 miles a day at that point in time. And I didn't have 10 plus days to go and do this trail. Um, but little by little, it became a reality where, you know, I can pull together five days and I can get my physical health to a point where I can do this in a five day window. And it just made this whole trip possible. And so to me, the biggest takeaway is there's insanely beautiful places in the world that aren't always that accessible. And if you have a desire to go and see those places, to experience those things, to feel those emotions, um, do it. And don't write it off right now. Just, just set that goal, build towards it, whether it takes you five years to make it happen or a year to make that happen. I think that everyone is capable to improve their situation um, and prepared to go and do something like that. And I promise you, on the other side of that, it's always worth it.